Hey guys, so today we're going to be checking out Halo Last Light, it's a review of a book, and the person doing reviewing is of course Halo Cannon, and I have Arco with me here. Hello. And Arco said that he needed to preface this with a bit of a discussion on what Spartan 3s are. Yes, indeed, quite, indeed, yes, indubitably. So, you know the Spartan 2s, they were 75 children stolen from their families at about the age five or six. They were given the best training and diet and exercise routine possible up until 14, where they were then augmented with very experimental, very dangerous surgical and chemical enhancements. And they were made, initially for the purpose of stomping the insurrection. When the Human Covenant War began, of course, the Spartan twos were instead used against that threat. There was a colonel on the UNSC Security Council named James Ackerson, right? He knew all about the Spartan twos, and while he abhorred the many ethical problems with them, he did see the need for them. But he recognized that putting all of humanity's future and hopes on the shoulders of only barely 75 people simply wasn't going to work in the long run, so he figured that we needed more Spartans. But humanity didn't have the time or resources to spare right. to make yet more Spartan twos. So he decided instead of pouring everything into f some six year olds, let's go for quantity over quality. So what he did was he had only, uh, organize the, Let's call it abduction of a particular Spartan 2 whose psych profile would seem to be best for the job. And they did this by orchestrating some bogus mission for Blue Team, and it was... Yeah, anyway, they separated him from the rest of the Spartan 2s and had him registered as missing in action. And the Spartan 2 they kidnapped was a guy named Kurt051. And essentially, they got him <coughs> and the guy who was the drill sergeant for the original Spartan 2s, a guy named Franklin Mendez. They put those two guys together and had them train a new generation of Spartans. However, these Spartans wouldn't be kids kidnapped from their families. No, these instead would be snatched up from the population of orphans left behind by the war. Oh, okay. And so in batches of about 400 each, they would take all these orphans and give them a choice. Work for us, become a Spartan, and take revenge on the Covenant, or you can go away and these orphans were trained honestly probably better than the Spartan 2s were if only because they had a Spartan training them who has a lot of had a lot of experience and what happened was there were three full companies of Spartan 3s created right each numbering at 300 alpha beta and gamma alpha and beta companies were sicked on <laughs> particular targets and almost all of them were wiped out lovely <laughs> which is a bad result but it's about what was expected by Atkinson. So the leader of leader and trainer of these Spartans, Kurt 051, he uh, 
got a bit sad. He got a bit fucking dejected because all of his kids kept dying. And so when the third company, Gamma, was going through their augmentations, he secretly added an extra one, which he felt would uh, give them a better, a better chance of survival. Okay. Uh, Spartan 3s, in general, have augmentations that are about half as effective as Spartan 2s, only far safer and far more reliable. And, you know, you can use those augmentations on a wider number of people because the genetic requirements or sort of standards were a bit looser. So a lot more compatible. Yeah. Gamma Company, thanks to Kurt051, have a bit of an extra thing where if they're grievously injured, it I forget what precisely it does and the precise wording, but it, is, it essentially allows them to ignore a lot more pain and a lot more damage than any than any other Spartan can, to the point that a Gamma Company Spartan 3 had, like, half of his torso just gone from plasma, from a plasma bolt, and he just kept going. He kept fighting. No. And it was only two minutes after the fighting ended and his adrenaline finally wore off that he realised, oh, shit, <laughs> I should be dead. <laughs> and then he dropped dead. <laughs> That's typically a bad way to go. And the the thing the the kick of it is, Gamma Company. They uh they graduated only like two weeks before the war ended, so most of them are still alive. But the big thing is, because of that extra augmentation to their brains that Kurt gave them, they have to take a. Mm, they're called smoothers. They essentially have to give themselves a, a bit of a, a, a drug just to make sure they don't have a psychotic break. That's every, always a good sign. Once every 12 hours, essentially. That's even better. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the Spartan 3s. Well, now that we have been primed, are you ready for Last Light? Oh, yep. Let's go. Remember, kids, good times rhymes with war crimes. Hey there, Canaanites. Welcome back. It's been far too long, but here we are. I'll make new excuses, simply apologize for my laziness in getting this done. That said, let's begin. Last Light is a murder mystery set in the Halo universe that does a great job of exploring the complex relationship between the UNSC slash Earth and the colonies that survived the Covenant onslaught. Mm. Best of all, to me at least, it finally addresses the fate of the Spartan 3s, specifically those of Gamma Company. In mid-2014, a being known as Catalog was roaming around the Halo Waypoint forums, answering questions posted by fans. At one point, a fan decided to ask about the status of known surviving Spartan 3s. The answer wasn't exactly what fans were expecting. Huh. Ash, Olivia, and Mark dead? Killed in a forum post? Well, you can imagine that people weren't exactly happy. Well, I'm happy to say that Last Life finally addresses that statement in ways I didn't think anyone would expect. One last thing before we start is a little bit of disclosure. I did receive an advanced free copy of the book, and that may influence my rating just a bit. I'd like to say that I did my best to draw objective conclusions and give a fair rating, but no one is free of bias. I am. I think the Tau should be. Ex I am. I think the Tau should be completely and totally annihilated from orbit. I will not disagree. <laughs> so, with that out of the way, let's begin. Everything after this is spoiler territory, so heads up. If you want to skip to the spoiler free wrap up, click the annotation on the screen or check the description box for the time to skip to. For everyone else, this is Halo Last Light. Our story technically starts on April 14th, 2553, with the destruction of Forerunner artifacts on Shaps 3. This may ring a bell. I hear that, and I, all I hear is the South Park s'more schnapps. 
I don't know why. For some of you, I and there's good reason for that. This event was originally described in Mortal Dictata when Sev Thal was demonstrating Pious Inquisitor's glassing beam to stuff on Senske. This destruction sent a signal to a Forerunner installation on Gao, once known as Edoed or Jakrula Support Base 4267, waking the site's local Ansula, Intrepid Eye. She, yes she, attempted to investigate the signal, eventually attempting to launch a recon probe to Shaps 3, aka Watru Thracis, or Jatkrula Installation 444-447. The launch caused a massive cave-in, damaging Intrepid Eye's installation. Following that, people who went into the cave suddenly emerged with lifelong ailments or scars suddenly healed. In what is Intrepid Eye? Is it like Guilty Spark? Yeah, the Forerunner and Scylla. Ah, uh, okay. Intrepid Eye's signal also attracted the attention of the UNSC, as anything Forerunner does. True. Upon arriving, the UNSC asked permission to land their 717th Xeno Materials Exploration Battalion. Much to the contention of some citizens and political officials, Gao President Aponte allowed it, and so the UNSC began their search for the Ancilla. The book itself starts at 0832 hours on July 2nd, 2553 in the Montero cave system on planet Gao, where bodies have been turning up, murdered in brutal manners. So, God, we have a lot to talk about right off the bat. First, Intrepid Eye, the first monitor with a female personality and one who belongs to a new class of Ancilla known as Archeon Class. In addition, she is in charge of something known as a Jatkrula support base. Now, Jatkrula may be better known as the Maginosphere, a protective boundary originally used during the early days of the Forerunner Ecumene and brought back during the Forerunner Flood War. Of course, up until now, we only knew of line installations designed to take down ships that passed within their range. A support base is something new. We also have Shaps 3, known as Installation 444-447. It's unclear whether that means that Chaps 3 was a line installation, but the name format would seem to support such a notion. Although the fact that Chaps 3 never brought down any ships would question its status as a line installation, unless it's a broken down or malfunctioning line installation. Next up is the 717th Battalion. Given the name Xenomaterials Exploitation, I have to wonder if they're part of Oni Reap X, aka the Reverse Engineering and Prototyping Xeno Archaeology Department. It's certainly possible. And finally, the dates. Oh my god, the dates. Dates and hours are finally back. Not since Ghost of Onyx have we been given precise times and dates for events, and it's certainly welcome back. I'll say it right now, this small edition really brought me back to the early days of Halo fiction, and in addition to other reasons, really made me feel like I was reading an Eric Nyland book again. Feel like. Troy Denning definitely has his own style that stands out, but there are many elements that remind me of those early novels. Anyway, back to the book. In light of the aforementioned murders, the Gao Ministry of Protection has assigned their top investigator, Veda Lopis, to investigate. At the same time, the UNSC has assigned Major Halal to assist. Spartan Team Blue, comprised of Fred 104, Linda 058, Kelly 087, Tom. Ah, yay, we have Spartan Fred again. What do you mean, man? It's Fred. Yeah, it's Fred. Tom B292, Lucy B091, Ash G099, Olivia G291. I won't Spartan Yef. And Mark G313 have also been ordered to tag along, helping wherever available and providing security. At least officially. And I'll just get it out of the way that is Olivia on the cover. Given the brutality of the murders, the first suspects for both the UNSC and Lopez would be the Spartan 2s. Given how little is known about them, both to the majority of the UNSC and to the Gao government, and given what Spartans are known to be able to do, it makes sense to put them at the top of the suspect list. As Lopez and her team are investigating a crime scene, Fred is informed of the discovery of another body and called aside by Major Halal and the Spart AI Wendell. Well, a fragment of Wendell, much like Bibi did in many occasions in Kilo 5. Okay. Wendell informs him that Major Halal and the private who discovered the body are going ahead to investigate the crime scene, but requests that Fred not inform Lopez as he wants to ensure the Gao Ministry of Protection, GMOP, isn't going to try and turn the case against the UNSC without evidence. Fred acknowledges, though he's clearly not happy about keeping secrets from the investigator. He doesn't outright say so, but the sarcasm in his voice makes it pretty clear. As Fred returns to the crime scene, he makes up a lie about where Halal is heading off to, in this case, taking a piss. This rouses suspicion from Lopez, but Fred responds with a light joke about the UNSC having protocols for everything. With her team investigating, Lopez huh. prepares to head to the service with a body that had been discovered while Fred escorts her. On board a transport known as a weasel, Lopez starts looking over a report put together by Major Halal. As noted before, the Spartans are prime suspects, but each have alibis for at least one of the murders, meaning it wasn't a single Spartan if any of them were involved. 
Other suspects include Gao radicals, disgruntled UNSC soldiers, and a redacted entry referring, of course, to Intrepid Eye. Lopez tries to question Fred about the redacted entry, referred to as Target Alpha for the sake of simplicity, but Fred is adamant that Alpha isn't the suspect, noting that it wouldn't have anything to gain by drawing so much attention. Instead, Fred suspects Gao radicals. Lo this is a lot to download, but is Fred a Spartan 3? He's a Spartan 2. Oh, he's a Spartan 2, okay. You Lopez can tell... You can tell it's a Spartan 3 if they have a letter at the beginning of their number designation. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Just had to get that clear in my own head. ...things over to the notion of some UNSC soldiers, but Fred shoots that down too, knowing that anything that could admit the brutality of the murders wouldn't be obtainable by standard UNSC soldiers. Lopez then brings up the Spartans, which introduces us properly to the Spartan 3s. Fred denies okay. that any of the Spartan 3s could have done it, noting that their spy armor doesn't provide the enhanced strength or speed that Mjolnir does. Fred even notes that Spartans can't break femurs with their bare hands. Now, I don't know about you, but I found this pretty strange. Yeah, I'm finding that strange myself. Technically speaking, it can take as little as 20 PSI to break bones, including a femur. I think a Spartan with enhanced strength could probably find a way to break a femur. Hell, a regular human can do it under the right conditions. Of course, Fred could be lying to protect his Spartans. Anyway, Fred and Lopi soon reach the surface, then head over to meet up with Battalion Commander Murtag Nelson. We briefly jump over to Halal, accompanied by his private, Hayes. Encountering Intrepid Eye, Hayes gets electrocuted, and Halal loses an arm before getting finished off. Intrepid Eye has a brief conversation with Wendell, learning about why the humans are present on Gao, then erases his memory of their conversation and implants a small part of herself in his programming. During this section, we also meet with something that was hinted at back in Hunter's... That was a lot in a very short amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I was just sitting there a little like, what? He, and now that, what happened? ...in the dark, a life worker Huragok, one that specializes in fixing... Ah uh, yes, flying scrutum monster. ...in the biological, rather than the mechanical. These particular Huragok have a green hue to them, rather than the standard blue of engineers. And as we learn later, only builder Huragok are referred to as engineers. It'd be interesting to find out if there's a particular term for life worker Huragak, though none comes up in this book. Moving forward, Fred, Lopez, and a coroner named Andrea meet up with Commander Nelson. Lopez, of course, wants okay. to know more about what the UNSC is looking for since it might be relevant to her investigation. Fred, meanwhile, is, well, Fred, to the letter of his orders. Over the course of conversation, Nelson reveals that a second body in a new crime scene had been discovered, unaware of Major Halal's desire to keep secrecy at that moment. With that revelation, the matter of what the UNSC is doing on Gao and how it may be connected to the murder starts to intensify, and Commander Nelson decides he's had enough. Pulling Fred aside, he orders the Spartan to tell Inspector Lopez about the Sentinels that the battalion has been encountering, if for no other reason than to rule them out. Meanwhile, Lopez is able to look in on the conversation through a window, making out certain words by reading their lips. Among the words she picks up are on Sentinel, Forerunner, and Ancilla. When their meeting concludes, Fred and Nelson meet up with Lopez and reveal that the 717th Battalion has been having trouble with Sentinels and then prepares to escort her and her team to the new crime scene. While they wait for Lopez's team to return to the surface, the only access to the new crime scene quite a ways away, Lopez checks in with the Gao Minister of Protection, something they're apparently supposed to do every 12 hours. Okay. Up in orbit, we meet our minister, Arlo Cassie, discussing the state of Gao and his concerns about the UNSC and the president with some unexpected characters. First, we have Reza Limburg from Venezia. Yeah, we're still not done with that hellhole. Our second guest is a Jural Hanai chieftain. Okay. Known as Castor, a. Great. Can you explain what the hell I'm looking at here? Uh, that's, uh, Castor. I, I know that's Castor. What about Lindbergh? I don't remember her, but apparently she's from the Kilo 5 trilogy, uh. which. <laughs> What's the Kilo 5 trilogy? Uh, remember those, uh, remember how I told you what happened after Halo 3 and how the whole thing with that author who did a shit job and read it there? Yeah. Yeah, those are her books. Oh, yeah, lovely. A Dokop, or leader of the Keepers of the One Freedom. Now, this is something I definitely have to talk about. The idea of a brute-led Covenant faction is something I've wanted to see since the start of 343's run with the Halo universe, and it's great to see that finally come to fruition. Even more interesting is that this faction accepts any species, even humans, so long as they worship the Forerunners as gods and believe in the Great Journey. 
Though I've made clear my desire to see the Covenant's role in Halo games reduced in favor of newer enemies, fighting the Keepers of the One Freedom in a future Halo game would be damn cool, especially if human enemies are included. Hmm. Moving forward, we learn that Cassie's ultimate goal is to take control of Gao, kick the UNSC off the planet with the help of the Keepers, and then form an alliance with Venezia. After character introductions, Cassie plays a recording of the report from Lopez earlier in the day. Lopez reveals what she had learned when spying on Fred and Nelson's conversation, and asks if Cassie can secure any information on Mjolnir's systems. While it seems unlikely that a Spartan is the killer at the moment, she needs to know if there's any way to take a Spartan down, if that turns out to be the case. When the recording finishes, Cassie turns to Castor, who is excited at the prospect of an oracle. He proposes a trade. Castor will provide Cassie with the Mjolnir specs, and in return, Cassie will sneak a force of 500 keepers to Gao to capture the oracle. Cassie is obviously shocked that Castor would have such information, and when he inquires as to how, Cassie says that he was an army commander during the war and just came across it. Now, I've speculated. I smell the familiar wafting scent of bullshit in the air. Mm. Mm. As to the fate of the army commander of Halo Wars before, but the use of those two words doesn't seem like coincidence. Could Castor have been the army commander from Halo Wars? Hell, if Halo Wars 2 is indeed set prior to the end of the Covenant War, could it still be Castor we saw in that trailer? I know some of these connections are, to be polite, speculation, but it would be cool if it turns out to be the case. The fact that Castor has access to Mjolnir specs does at the very least seem to draw a connection between him and the Chieftain from the Halo Wars 2 trailer. But anyway, with the proposal made, Cassie agrees. Back on Gao, we arrive at the scene of the newly discovered murder, but see no sign of Halal and Hayes. After an hour of searching, Fred, Lopez, another investigator named Cirillo, and the Gammas finally come across the bodies of Halal and Hayes. As we know, both bodies have been brutally murdered. Fred recovers the Wendell AI fragment from Halal's arm, but when Lopez tries to ask Wendell what happened, he basically blows her off. Meanwhile, Cirillo has discovered a trail using fluorescent spray. The group bags the bodies of Halal and Hayes and caches them for later retrieval and proceeds to follow the trail. After almost 12 hours, Cirillo runs out of fluorescent spray and it seems that their tracking has come to an end. Luckily- 12 hours with that shit? <laughs> Apparently. What kind of fucking tank does she have for that? Jesus. Lee Lopez notices that the target had turned around the same point where the fluorescent spray had run out, giving the group a vector to follow for a while at least. Unknown to the group, Intrepid Eye is watching. She contacts the Wendell Fragment, trying to get him to get the group to turn around. When she threatens the life of the Spartan Threes, Wendell merely retorts that dying is what Spartan Threes do best. Wow, Wendell. <laughs> That's a big oof. Just, a wow. But anyway, Intrepid Eye erases the recording of their conversation from Wendell's memory and sends her last four sentinels to eliminate the human invaders. Over the course of the battle, Cirillo is killed by a sentinel beam, and another sentinel drops a rock on Olivia, breaking her legs. The final sentinel is killed by Olivia, her special gamma augmentations giving her the drive to rise up on the two broken legs and kill the thing. While ultimately victorious, a cave-in was triggered during the encounter, cutting the group off from using the same way they arrived to get out. Fred leaves to investigate the cave-in, leaving Mark, Ash, and Olivia with Lopez. During the time that Fred is gone, Lopez discovers just how young the Gammas and Spartan Threes in general are. As expected, she's fairly upset with the UNSC. She further discovers that the Gammas in particular need a special drug, colloquially called a smoother, to keep them in check. Naturally, Lopez starts to shift her suspicions to the Gammas. As time passes, she specifically suspects Mark, as he seems to degrade faster than the other two. Also, this is this is why you don't have super soldiers dependent on drugs to continue. This, yeah. This is why you don't. During that period, the group encounters Rome's alone, which reveals itself in order to heal Olivia. Fred, meanwhile, had come across the Jacquula support. The name of the thing is Rome's alone. I love, I love those things' names. <laughs> Based though he'd never know it just by looking. It would seem to have some sort of forerunner disorientation system, as when Fred is finally contacted by the Gammas, he realizes he's been standing around for hours just staring. When he learns of the discovery of the Huragak, he returns to the Gamma's location and they decide to make their way to the surface. I think now's a good time to pause and talk about a minor annoyance with this book, Olivia's nickname. When she was introduced in Ghost of Onyx, she was nicknamed O because of her stealth, whisper quiet as her vowel namesake, as the book puts it. In this novel, she's constantly called Livy. Now, I really have no issue with Fred or the other Spartan 2's Maybe her, she got like consistent ones on her stealth roll and lost the nickname and the letter. Perhaps. 
<laughs> Calling her this, but I'd expect her fellow Spartan 3s, at the very least the Gammas, to refer to her by her original nickname. Like I said, it's a minor annoyance, but it's something I wanted to bring up. Anyway, on the surface, Castor and some of his keepers have finally landed on Gao. With the destruction provided by Cassier, Castor sends his second-in-command, or soon, into the cave scene. That is literally the worst picture of a bird I've ever seen. It looks like a, it looks like a defunct Power Ranger. It's from Halo 3. It still looks terrible the way it's like shown right now. Mm. System to search for the Ancilla. Not long after, however, Castor spots the other Spartans of Blue Team, Kelly, Linda, Tom, and Lucy, delivering a body bag to a pelican. Thinking that it's the Ancilla that he seeks, Castor starts a surprise attack by shooting down the pelican. His forces then move in as a full-on battle breaks out. Meanwhile, in the caves, hours have passed and the Spartan Threes are running out of smoothers. Mark is scouting ahead and his behavior is only feeding Lopi's suspicion about the Gamma. At one point, as Spartan and Ash are scouting ahead, they come across a group of Keepers, all dead in Mark's hand. Back with Lopis and Olivia, the two find themselves under attack by a Gerald Hanai Keeper. Thankfully, Mark shows up to finish it off and the group continues forward to the cave exit. After another 12 hours, totaling close to three days since Fred and company had left for that murder scene, they have a close-up encounter with Intrepid Eye, she now hosting her consciousness in a flatworm-like inspection drone. Above, the battle rages so hard that it's shaking the cave ceiling. Fred sends Ash ahead to scout and hopefully find Mark again, while Lopis, Olivia, and the Huragok hold back. Fred, meanwhile, sneaks up on the drone, hoping to tag it with a scramble grenade, an experimental piece of Oni tech that should disable it. Unknown to Fred, Intrepid Eye is basically turning herself over so she can access UNSC interstellar communications and hopefully contact the Ecumene. Hooray! Back with Lopez and Olivia, the two find themselves in the presence of Petra Zoya, one of Arlo Cassidy's friends. Zoya puts a shotgun to Olivia's head and tries to get Lopez to help her take the Huragok and Ancilla to Cassie. Though Lopez has no idea who Zoya is and even has her gun pointed at the woman, their mutual connection to the minister raises Olivia's suspicions about the inspector. When Fred manages to tag Intrepid Eye with the scramble grenade, the resulting blinding light allows Olivia to disarm and kill Zoya and disarm Lopez. When Fred returns, he makes Olivia drop any idea of interrogating Lopez, the battle on the surface, and the recent capture of the Ancilla taking priority. When they finally emerge from the caves near Wendosa Hotel, the group finds themselves in a virtual war zone. After finding out where the rest of Blue Team are, Fred and company try to regroup, but on the way, Rome's alone removes the scramble grenade, freeing Intrepid Eye. The Ancilla makes Dick move, dick thing. Thanks <laughs> for Wendosa, where she. Engineers are like children, man. You, you can't really. They don't, they, don't really uh, they don't really have it all together up there. Cuts off all communications. UNSC, Gao, and Keepers. Everyone is now in the dark. Fred, Olivia, Ash, and Lopez soon catch up with the Ancilla and Huragok and manage to capture both with little trouble. Soon, however, they come across Mark with his knife to a sergeant's throat. Thankfully, Fred is able to talk him down. The sergeant informs Fred that Commander Nelson wants him and the Ancilla evacuated, and that a Falcon is en route. As they make their way to the landing zone, the group is attacked by Gerald Hanai keepers. However, the rest of Blue Team, Kelly, Linda, Tom, and Lucy, show up, and together they're able to take out their attackers. When the hmm. Falcon finally shows up, Fred, the Ancilla, and members of Lopez's team are evacuated. However, the Falcon doesn't make it very far before it's shot down by other keepers. When Blue Team and Lopez discover this, they head out to search for any survivors. Above the planet, Minister Cassie is on board the Esmeralda, one of 20 corvettes that make up Gao's protection fleet, keeping an eye on a local UNSC fleet that had arrived to reinforce their forces. Denied permission to land, Cassie has been authorized to attack if they attempt to do so. When the fleet finally does attempt to sneak some landing craft to the surface, Cassie is quick to shoot them down, not worrying about retaliation as he knows the UNSC won't risk another insurrection on Gao. Tell me, like, is this a common thing with human colony worlds doing this? Or was the insurrection like a flash in the pan kind of thing? What led to it? Ah, the insurrection. Well, it's the same old shit as every other thing in human history. The inner colonies were very wealthy and densely populated, and they needed resources from the outer colonies. Uh, okay. The outer colonies outnumbered the inner colonies four to one, but were very fairly sparsely populated, and many of the outer colonies were specifically colonized for a specific purpose, like farming or mining or anything else. So basically, this is just a situation where 
the the core worlds made too many demands and the insurgency rose because of that a little bit yeah it's also um essentially uh, yeah the inner colonies depended on the outer colonies but at the same time feared them the outer colonies were full of people who just hated over centralized power and bureaucrats so works pretty- Further, Casilla makes known his plans to overthrow President Aponte with the help of other ministers. Planet side, Lopez and Blue Team are making their way to Fred's crash site. Unfortunately, they run into a pack of Jural Hanai led by Castor and now in possession of the Ancilla. While Blue Team takes care of the majority of brute forces, Lopez is able to make her way up towards the wreckage where she runs into Castor himself, the Dokap having pulled out the locked up armor of Fred. Lopez, thinking Fred to be dead and furious at the death of her friends who had been on board, shoots out the chieftain's knee and shoots at one of his hands, causing Castor to drop the Spartan. The impact causes a mini rock slide as Fred begins sliding down the hill. With the hill soon under beam rifle fire and Fred flying towards her, Lopez jumps on the Mjolnir armor and literally rides him down to the bottom of the hill. Surfing Fred. <laughs> <laughs> As they reach the bottom, the battalion's Alpha Company arrives to aid in the fight. Lopez more or less passes out and awakens in the Vitality Center, the location where Fred and Lopez's friends were originally being evacuated to. Not long after waking up, she meets with Commander Nelson and the two strike a deal. In return for keeping her mouth shut about the secrets of the Montero cave system and pinning the murders on the Jarl Hanai, Lopez would be able to take scrapings from the spy armors, Fred's Mjolnir, and the Ancilla to satisfy her personal curiosity about who committed the murders. Inside, a portable Spartan support module, Intrepid I, wakes up. Intent on escaping, she stops the communications jamming to provide a distraction. Before she can leave, however, she's contacted by Wendell. To gain her cooperation, Wendell promises to help Intrepid I contact the Forerunners and access any information humans have on them. Meanwhile, Lopez arrives to begin her scrapings. As Intrepid Eye continues to scan Wendell's records, basically summing up all we know of the Forerunner War with the Flood, the activation of the Array, their exile, and the major events of the Bungie Halo games and human interaction with Forerunner technology, it seems like the Ancilla is ready to accept the truth. But then, she throws Wendell for a loop. She asks which humans she is to serve, drawing on the conflict between the UNSC and Gao government. She further learns that Minister Cassie is now president and has chosen to attack the UNSC. Disappointed at this divide and the violent nature of humanity, Intrepid Eye decides that none of them are worthy of the mantle. She destroys Wendell just as he's able to warn of the imminent Gao threat and attacks a local marine that had been in the module with Lopez and Commander Nelson. I don't like the Ancil- The Ancilians just annoy me. They just really do. I don't know why. It's just pissing me off. It's because this is abominable intelligence. A uh, hundred thousand years of a power nap is, uh, is a hell of a drug. Yes. I will say, this is one instance where having this review delayed so long is something of a blessing, as we can see here an early instance of a Forerunner AI to find the wishes of her creators, not entirely unlike what the Warden did in Halo 5. Anyway, Intrepid Eye takes control of the module and begins killing the humans inside. Yeah. Nelson and Lopez try to escape, but as they make for an airlock, the hatch slams down on Nelson killing him and trapping Lopez inside. Luckily, she is just barely saved by Fred, Ash, and Olivia, the rest of Blue Team having been out on a patrol and still making their way back. Of course, just as they save the Inspector, Intrepid Eye attacks. Thankfully, her drone is badly damaged already and goes down fairly quickly. The Spartans tag it with another Scrambler just in case, then suit up. They recover Wendell's data chip, now secretly housing Intrepid Eye, and take a Havoc nuke in order to destroy the Forerunner ruins on Gao, making sure now President Cassier won't get his hands on them. As the group moves towards the Forerunner site in a Warthog, they are pursued by Wyvern aircraft. In mm. order to take them out, the group splits up. Lopez takes the Huragok and drone to hide, Ash and Olivia jumping out to protect her, and Fred keeps going, drawing the Wyverns towards him. Two of the Wyverns are quickly taken care of, along with any Gao militia they drop. Once regrouped, Beta explains that she believes Intrepid Eye is the murderer and that it had devoured Wendell, now inhabiting his data chip. Now interestingly, during the scene, Fred doesn't speak to Lopez over comms, she- so they can do that. They can they can have it what would be to them primitive technology. It would seem so, yeah. Yay. She fearing that the Ancilla might be listening in, but instead has Fred open his visor to talk more or less face to face. Now this notion of opening the visor appears in a few other earlier sections, but I thought I would talk about it now. It's not canon breaking or anything, but it's certainly a new concept in the fiction that, to me, just doesn't sit well. The idea that the visor can open, whatever that means, seems like it would be a major weakness in the suit design. 
and honestly, I have trouble imagining it. Does it slip up into the top of the helmet, or does it flip open, or what? It's a weird addition that was really only added so that Fred would have a reason to keep his helmet on at all times. I might be spending too much time worrying about this, but, well, there you go. Anyway, upon Lopez revealing all this, Intrepid Eye takes control of Fred's suit and tries to kill Lopez. Now you see why Lovely. Fred couldn't take his helmet off, narratively speaking. Luckily, Lopez had placed a small explosive on the armor in a key area when she was taking her scrapings. She had feared that Fred might try to interfere if she ended up arresting Mark, and though not for the same reasons, it seems her worry was at least somewhat justified. On a side note... She seriously put a mine on him? <laughs> and he didn't I know. Don't ask me what kind, what the hell kind of private investigator carries that shit. This is going off the rails fast. And since I get asked about it a lot, I have to wonder how well this fits into MatPat's theory regarding why Spartans can get killed by a single hit to the back of the neck. What's happening here is very similar, and yet Fred's armor doesn't collapse and crush him. Granted, the gel layer puffs up and that might be supporting the weight, but then I have to wonder why this doesn't happen with regular back taps. Regardless, this is all off topic. So, as the group works to get Fred out of his armor and remove the data chip holding Intrepid Eye, they are attacked by more Gauss soldiers. Luckily, the rest of Blue Team finally shows up and saves them. After extracting Fred from his armor and securing the data chip, the Havoc is primed for 10 minutes and the group heads to the extraction zone. Along the way, Lopez is contacted by President Cassie, he hoping that she'll give away her position. She's too smart though, and now realizing just what kind of man Cassie is, is able to lead the Wyverns away from their position. During all this, Intrepid Eye resigns herself to her fate, though decides that eventually the humans will slip up and present an opportunity for her to escape. When she does escape, she'll follow up on a strange signal she received from the Epilogue system, the system containing Requiem and the Didact. Now I have to wonder if we might see Intrepid Eye in future media, even games. Of course, we're still- Why don't they just, like, pass her underneath a fucking magnet or something? <laughs> In fact, that's my solution to this problem. Just pass it underneath a fucking magnet and call it good. I don't know that a simple magnet would kill a foreigner answer. I don't give a shit. I will try anything. Still waiting to hear back from Guilty Spark slash Chaka, so perhaps I shouldn't get my hopes up. Anyway, with nothing patrolling the local skies, the group is able to move towards the Well of Echoes, where they can drop the nuke right into the Forerunner installation. Near the well, they dump the Warthog, Fred setting his now useless armor to detonate. It isn't long before they finally arrive at the well, 60 seconds left on the Havoc, where they're finally extracted by an owl insertion craft. On board, Lopez is greeted by Admiral Siren Osman, while Mark drops the nuke into the well. The owl escapes, and the nuke destroys the Forerunner site. Yay. Not long after, on the surface, President Cassie and his rival, Minister of War Gaspar Baez, observe the former Forerunner site. Cassie elects to hide the truth about the Forerunner artifacts and Vita Lopez's betrayal, instead intending to report that the Inspector had died in the attacks on the Vitality Center and claiming that the Spartans were responsible for the murders. In order to keep soldiers who knew the truth quiet, Cassie offers to keep Baez in his current position, to which the Minister agrees. On board the Owl, called Silent Claw, Osman and Lopez have a chat. Osman finds herself impressed with the Inspector's abilities and wants her to join Oni. She further reveals that the Spartans of Gamma Company present a bit of a problem, considering their unique augmentations. I'm not that impressed with her. She seems doggedly, like, committed. Just to a, a utterly stupid line of thinking. It's like, I'm going to investigate these murders. There's brutes on the planet. I'm investigating a murder. There's, there's a forerunner ancillary on the planet. I'm investigating the murder. We blew up a Forerunner station. The murder. It's like she doesn't fucking switch gears at any point. She, apparently she's just really dedicated to her job. It's like, congratulations. I figured out who it was. It was Mr. Biddles in the living room with the candlestick. It's like we're not even playing the same fucking game anymore. If word were ever to get out, it would cause a serious problem for the UNSC and the new Spartan branch. However, Team Saber has a unique opportunity. Having been declared KIA on Gao, Osman now wants Lopez to become a leader for them, acting as a ferret team. They go in and solve any problems Oni may need such a team to deal with. Oh with few God. other options, Lopez and the Gammas accept. The book then comes to a close on Gao, where Castor and Arsun are slowly making their way to the Keeper Rendezvous Point. Castor tries to get Orsun to leave him, noting that neither will make the rendezvous at their current pace, but Orsun refuses. 
The two soon come across Rome's alone, who heals Castor's wounds. When Orsoon attempts to capture it, Castor tells him to let it go, seeing its work as a gift from the Oracle. As they make their way towards the rendezvous, what? Castor begins plotting his revenge on Cassie. And that concludes Halo Last Light. Damn, what a book! The murder mystery, the keepers of the one freedom, the politics, there's so much to love in this book. There's so much to love in this book, but at the same time, a book, a book review like this, I mean, he summed up that entire book in 25 minutes. And there's so much just left out that just makes me, like, head slamming door irritated. <laughs> <laughs> Fred and the Gammas are wonderfully characterized, and while it's said that Blue Team and the Betas don't get as much screen time, their personalities too are well captured. Troy Denning has done an outstanding job with this novel, and I really hope he gets to return in the future. So, after months of consideration and deep thought, I have to give this book a 9.5 out of 10. It's so damn close to a perfect 10, but the minor annoyances do hold it back from being all that it could be. Well, thank you all for your infinite patience. By now, Shadow of Intent is out, and I'm likely reading it or writing the review, which- <laughs> Look at that face! Tell me about the rabbits, George. What do you mean, man? It's the shipmaster. <laughs> I don't give a shit! But it's the shipmaster, it's cool. <laughs> I know he is, but look at his eyes. This is totally tell me about the rabbits, George. Now, Shadow of Intent is out, and I'm likely reading it or writing the review. Which will not come out three months later, by the way. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. There we go. So, your thoughts, Argo? It's a real big fucking shame that Troy Denning's work just goes downhill from here. What else did he do that is like a disappointment? Well, uh, he did Retribution, which was just more of, which, it was essentially just this again, but even more, just, this story and Retribution are kind of just meh, but, you know, it fills out the time and it does introduce you to Fred, which is why I wanted to do this. Okay. And then Denning wrote Silent Storm and Oblivion. Both of which are incredibly irrelevant and do things which irritate me. But that's a different topic. <laughs> okay, so my thoughts are, like, I, Halo Cannon did a good job with this, but at the same time, summarizing a story like this is like trying to summarize a story from the Horse Heresy. You know, you're not going to be able to do that relatively quickly because there's too much shit going on, you know? Just, like, way too much shit. Eventually, you're going to lose off track. And I'm, I was sitting there just trying to keep the characters in order. It it was a thing. And the floating green penis monster didn't help matters. <laughs> Eternal trauma. Eternal trauma. Yeah. Uh, just utter nightmare creature. All right, guys. So that was Halo Cannon's last slight review. Um... One of these days, I might be able to get books again that aren't 40k related and read things. But, that's not going to be in the next couple of months, so I suffer daily. That is the thing. In any case, um, like and subscribe to Halo Cannon if you haven't already, and like and subscribe to me. Please leave a comment down below if you enjoyed the video, because it does help me with the algorithm. I'm constantly fighting the algorithm like a pit fighter. Um, if you'd like to support the channel, there's a Patreon down below. And this has been Arco. Bye-bye. And this has been me. Bye-bye. And we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>